So good morning, everybody, and uh, thank to the organizers for having me here. And apologies for those that came for the title uh, about dark matter, but I was asked uh, 40 minutes ago to change it, so this is the result. I took an old talk and I added a couple of slides. So what I will talk about instead of dark matter, ah, by the way, if you're interested in anything, you can ask offline about dark matter in most states, uh, dark matter at the PV, etc. So what I will talk about now instead is uh, uh, they are action as a new way to look for supersymmetry, and this is based on a work with uh, Brando and Javi that are here, Alberto Mariotti in Brussels and Diego Redigolo uh, at Weizmann in Tel Aviv. So, as I usually do in short conferences where I last presented this, I start with the take-home message. And uh, so the take-home message is, you know, is uh, trying to answer this question, is there any other sign of supersymmetry to be looked for at colliders, not only at the LHC, other than the usual ones, like gluino stops, etc., that were mostly, arguably, motivated by naturalness, by, by the Swiss solution to the hierarchy problem. So in this paper, we argue that the answer is yes, in the particle of the R action, that is, as I will argue, a quite generic prediction of supersymmetry. And not only we studied this particle in a range, in a wide mass range where it had never been st uh, studied before, but also we found that this particle could be the first sign of Suzette colliders. And, I mean, uh, of course, gave us uh, two properties of the SUSI sector that is related to it, so the SUSI breaking sector, and opens many new phenomenological and model building avenues, some of which we are exploring, and I have the two last slides about that. So let me start about motivating their action. So first, one slide recap about our symmetries. So n equal one supersymmetry is always accompanied by one continuous U1R that is defined by the fact that it doesn't commute with the SUSI generators, and it's called R symmetry. The fact that it doesn't commute with the, the supersymmetric transformation generators means that the charge assignments of fields that live in the same supermultiplets are different. For example, uh, in a uh, chiral superfield, if the scalar, for example, the stop, has a certain charge, then the fermion, for example, the top, has the same charge minus one, etc., and so on. Uh, since vector superfields are real, I mean, this implies that gay genos have always are charge one. I mean, this is subject to the assumption that, I mean, to this normalization of their symmetry. But just this is a number to keep in mind. Gay genos have R charge one. Then, if, the Lagrange, if we demand the Lagrangian to be R-symmetric, this implies that superpotential needs to have R charge 2, unlike with any other symmetry. The reason is that, I mean, this is the way you get the Lagrangian, you have two insertion of the uh, Grassmann variable that transform under R. Then, okay, this is what R symmetries are, then why you should bother? So there is a generic result by Nelson and Cyberg in the 90s that states that if supersymmetry is broken in the global minimum of the theory, and if the superpotential is generic, meaning that it contains all the terms that are not forbidden by any symmetry, then the Lagrangian should respect such a symmetry. On the other hand, in the minimal supersymmetry standard model and closer relatives, U1R needs to be broken because of two phenomenological reasons. One is the fact that we want to give to the gay genus Majorana masses. Remember, the gay genus have a charge one. Second reason, independent of that, is that if you want to achieve electroweak symmetry breaking and give masses to the Xenos, then you can see that, I mean, you cannot find an R-charge assignments for the Xenos superfields that allow to respect our symmetry in the theory compatibly with these two terms. So these are two fino motivations and uh, ways out to respect the natural sample result. And these fino motivations are, for example, to break U1R spontaneously. And this gives automatically raise to a massless Goldstone boson in the spectrum, which is their action. Of course, you could also, I mean, you have the option of extending the MSSM until you build, uh, for example, the minimal or symmetric, uh, supersymmetric standard model, but this is not what I will talk about. Also, you can violate one of these two assumptions. For example, you can say that supersymmetry is not broken in a global minimum, instead, it's broken in a metastable vacuum where we live in that has a very long lifetime that, I mean, allows the def for the fact that we are still there and we have not yet decayed to the SUSI preserving vacuum. This was explored also for other reasons uh, in the now 10 years ago. And, I mean, one can show that in these theories, an analogous of Nelson Cyberg holds for an approximate U1R, meaning that their action is not a pure Goldstone anymore, but is a pseudo Goldstone and gets a small mass 
MA. Now, this was just. I remember, you know, back in the 90s, that this was one of the reasons why people didn't do gauge mediation, and then there was a paper by Bagger. Exactly, I will come to that paper in a couple of slides. So. Uh, so there are. So uh, there are some obstru obstruction to gauge uh, the UNR. For example, you have to. So as far as I remember, because I, I looked into this like when working here. Uh, so there are. Uh, so if you gauge UNR, like generically, you get anomalies, and. Uh, I so people have tried and have shown that uh, there was no way to have an anomaly free U1R. Uh, so if they if they are charge assignments, so okay, now remember, if they are charge assignments respect like our family universal, there is no way to uh, find UNR charge assignments that respect that are non anomalous. I mean, in that case, if you gauge it, uh, I mean, that will be uh, the, the related gauge boson, and I don't know, you will have to break it, it will have a mass. I mean, you will have a particle that is arguably light in the spectrum because uh, little f, the scale of subs breaking times, they of R symmetry breaking times a coupling, have to give rise to the masses of gauge enos, uh, etc. So, depending on where we put the gauge masses, for example, you will have a light particle. But to gauge it, there are some obstructions. You need to have R charge assignments that are non family universal. Yeah, this is what. Uh, is what I remember, yeah. Ah, right, right, because you need to cancel the cosmological constant. Yeah, and yeah, I remember we were discussing about uh, how to cancel the cosmological constant there, that we had some doubt uh, about the fact that you really need the Susie breaking scale to be that high, but I mean, maybe we can discuss this offline. But yes, yes. Like For yeah, for Fino, he's what he's saying. Yeah, well, this the form one. of the superpotential is Fino, right? Hmm? The form of the superpotential is Fino. No, yeah, but if the new particle is at uh, Planck scale, then uh, I mean. I'm just yeah. saying this, the, the allowed couplings could be determined by your RCM. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, in this sense, uh, yeah, I would say so. Yeah. So, coming to instead non caging U1R, still a <laughs> global symmetry. And let's try to describe what are the ingredients in the infrared that are ultimately of interest for phenomenology. So, of course, the standard model, then the Goldstone, the action from UNR breaking, then the Goldstone from SUSI breaking, the Goldstino. And the three parameters here are the UNR breaking scale, little f, the SUSI breaking scale, big F, and the action mass. And now let me spend a few words on the action mass. So this comes from a small asymmetry breaking, which is quite generic, and this is to answer Chaba's question so far. It was noticed uh, soon after uh, the paper by Nelson and Seiberg that tuning the cosmological constant to zero in the superpotential introduced an explicit asymmetry breaking that allows to write, I mean, that generates a mass term for the R action of this size, more or less. I mean, here are the parameter M3 alpha is the mass of the gravitino, so that one could generically expect a mass of the are action of the order of 10, 100 MeV or so. I mean, as I told you, one can have a mass for their action, a small mass, I mean, in other constructure, like metastable supersymmetry breaking, and then, I mean, it has shown uh, to happen in some explicit models of SUSI breaking, they provide a mass, sometimes small, sometimes large, for their action. So far, this one is the only mass range that's been studied about their action by this paper by Go and Iben in 2008. And then, to our knowledge, I mean, nobody else has studied the phenomenology of this particle. 
And studying the phenomenology of these particles is what we did in this paper. So uh, let me talk about the I mean the Lagrangian of our interest. To build it, it's useful to use the constraint superfluid formalism, where I mean it's kind of the analogous of imposing constraint as you do with the ordinary Goldstones. The constraint that you impose on your uh, superfields are this one, and X is the one that describes the Goldstino, and R is the one that describes the Araxian that contains in, in this way. So this, let's now first consider just the hidden sector. Let's forget for the moment about MSSM fields, etc. So the most general effect Lagrangian you can write is this one, Kähler and superpotential. And I mean, here you have the usual uh, kinetic terms, uh, here, Susie breaking, and this term for the Araxian. So this term, notice that it would be absent for any other Araxian unless it's 1R, because this, I mean, this has charge 2 in the symmetry. So remember, the superpotential carry charge 2. Then this term, which is pretty unique, leads to the first phenol prediction, which is a coupling between the Araxian and two Goldstini. And this implies that the Araxion, I mean, the Goldstini is eaten by the Gravitino, so that the Araxion can decay to two Gravitini. And so we have Araxion decay to missing energy as a first prediction. And then there is also an upper bound on this Araxion decay that comes from, I mean, general considerations of uh, unitarity and analysis and analyticity. And that gives this upper bound on the Araxion width in two Goldstini. Let us now come to the interactions of the Araxion with the visible sector. So this is the Lagrangian. Yeah, so if you, I mean, if you pump up the Araxion, the Goldstino mass, uh, I mean, if you want to put it really high, you hit a mass of the Araxion which goes beyond any range of a phenol interest. So, I mean, in the case that we are interested in... Yeah, I mean, I'm sure one can find ways out. I mean, I'm sure. I would bet one can find ways out. But, like, generically, if you pump up the gravitino, then uh, you lose uh, interest in the phenomenology of this particle. So, yes, interactions of the Araxion with gauge fields and gauge inos. The first line in the, in the slide. So the first term, which is an anomaly, gives rise to you know, coupling of the Araxion with FF dual standard model gauge fields. It also gives rise to a coupling of the Araxion to Gaginos, which however receives its most sizable contribution from a Majorana mass term for the Gaginos that you can write generically in this way, and that gives rise to a coupling A Gagino Gagino. This is all dictated by the charge assignments uh, that just depend on the normalization of uh, I mean oh the, the, the normalization of the definition of their symmetry. So X phenomenology, I mean the relation with Higgs is a standard model fermions, is slightly more model dependent because it depends on an arbitrary charge, which is the sum of the charges of the H of H up and H down. So that depending on what you choose for this value, you can have if this value is different from two, you you induce coupling of the Araxion with Xenos. And if this value is different from zero, you have a mixing between the Araxion from this term here, from the B mu term and the MSSM pseudoscalar A. And these, uh, you know, a mixing of this size, suppressed by B over F, proportional to discharge and with some uh, time beta dependence. This mixing induces couplings of their action to all the standard model fields that are <coughs> no, proportional to their masses, and, and they have some time beta dependence. I mean, here, just notice that, unlike uh, for uh, the case of the MSSM pseudoscalar, here you cannot have big enhancements of this coupling by going to extreme time beta regions. Also, I mean, last, this induces a cap, uh, this coupling between the Higgs boson and two Araxians, so that there are if the Araxion is lighter than the Higgs boson mass, you can have the decay of the Higgs boson to two Araxians. And so here and in the following, uh, I mean, for simplicity, I will consider the masses of the fermions and the other MSSM Higgses to be decoupled, meaning from the LHC reach. But they can be, I mean, they can go back in the game. I have a backup slide on that. Now, before going to describing the phenom, uh, let me just give you one slide about uh, possible UV completion, which is strongly coupled. I mean, strongly coupled because uh, so to have interesting phenom, we generically need a quite low, I mean, very low in the jargon of SUSI, SUSI breaking scale, big F. So this can be motivated by considerations of naturalness in combination with the measured value of the X mass, and this was noted already in 2011. 
Then it has been, uh, there has been a reprisal of this recently uh, when people study the implications of LXG exclusions to the most natural to these scenarios. And then a very low energy distributing scale helps also with gravitational cosmology. Now, such a low uh, energy distributing scale needs uh, a strongly coupled sector as a v-completion, I mean naively because of the scaling, because <coughs> if you assume that the Gaginos, for example, are Majorana, this is how their mass scales with the M star, which is the mass gap of the hidden sector. So this M star is, you know, square root of a coupling time S F naively. So if F is low, this number uh, is low that so that if you instead of G star you have a four pi, the Gaginos will be in a region that are already ruled out by the LHC. So that, I mean, you write in this way, where G star larger than one is a coupling between the states of the hidden sector. <coughs> to make things, uh, you know, maybe more clear, this is the, I mean, a possible sketch of the resulting spectrum. You have your hidden states, for example, your messengers at this scale, which can be tens of TV, for example. The gauge enos here, the axion, uh, depending on the parameter of explicit uh, or symmetry breaking here, and the Gostino lighter. So this is how, I mean, one can define a consistent power counting and apply uh, you know, a la silch, for example, and apply it to uh, this picture, and this is the result. And just notice here that according to this power counting, the decay of the action to two gravitini saturates the upper bound that I was talking about it two slides ago. So this was just to I mean, provide a sketch of a possible view completion that I will not touch later. And now I come to the phenomenology. So. First of all, what we studied in this paper was this region of masses between 2GV and 2TV. 2TV, if you want, is just a psychological upper bound because we want to still be talking about a pseudo Goldstone boson. And if you take it too heavy, then it's not a Goldstone anymore. And this mass range, if you want, is arbitrary. It's just for definiteness because, I mean, there was already so much phenol here that uh, we didn't want to go in the region of being dump and other experiments. But of course, it would be motivated and worth to go uh, below this value. Then, we also assume other particles to be decoupled. I mean, decoupled means beyond the reach of LHC14, so that a benchmark of decoupled particles is, for example, the following one. Binos at 500 uh, GV, and so on, gluinos at 2.5 TV. This, just to match it with the previous description, would correspond to a scale uh, of messenger of roughly 20 TV for a coupling G star that, uh, that is 3. Uh, notice, however, that the values of the Gagino masses do not matter for the axon phenomenology, phenomenology as long as they are heavier than half of the axon mass. The reason is that I mean, their contribution to the couplings of their axon, uh, etc., uh, you know, in, in the heavy mass limit, just becomes an anomaly. So it's another contribution to the anomaly. So it saturates to a certain value. Here, for example, you see, I mean, just an example, the width of their axon to two gluons, to digit. Here you have an anomaly contribution that is matched, for example, to the case, uh, I mean, the usual case of messengers in the 5 plus 5 bar of SU5. And you see that this loop of gluinos in the limit of gluinos much heavier than half of the reaction mass goes to 1, so that this gives an effective contribution to the anomaly that is 3. And analogously for the quarks. So this fermions is more model dependent, and uh, they have less of an impact, arguably, on the phenomenology of their action. But also this last statement depends on how you model them. And just for the purpose of this paper, we assume them to be decoupled enough not to affect the phenomenology, which is something that you can do. I mean, we want to see what are the predictions that are less model dependent, because as I remind you... But you said they could be either above or below. Yeah, they, they could be also below. Like, yeah, I mean, they, uh, they could be here. But that would be more model dependent, while given the normalization of their charge, the coupling of the, to the Gaginos is fixed, assuming they don't get a direct mass. But at least in the MSSM and closer relatives, this is a solid, a solid prediction of, the, of this scenario. So you know, if you fix this benchmark with all the other SUSI particles decoupled, then you study the phenomenology, and then you can answer this question. Could the reaction be the first sign of supersymmetry at colliders? Now, uh, how to pr first, how to produce the reaction? Uh, at LHC, we have this vertex, HG dual, so resonant production in PP collisions. This is <coughs> the expected size of the gluon fusion cross section at 13 TV as a function of the reaction mass for a benchmark case of little f 3 TV. 
Notice that this prediction scale with f square. And you can see that depending on the values of the anomaly, here the green line is zero UV anomalies, here is UV anomalies over the 10, you can have cr production cross section that reach you know, even uh, 10 to the 6, so 10 to the 3 picobarn. So you produce a lot of this, I mean, uh, many, many of these particles. This dash, the line, is just uh, with respect to the continuous one, is just the residual dependence on tangent beta, because if you remember the coupling here, most importantly to the top, is this tangent beta dependence. But as you can see, it's not very relevant to determine the, 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 the production cross section. Then, this is a way to produce it. You can also produce it in the case of other particles, like for example in, the, in Higgs decays, thanks to this coupling. And here, I plot the vanishing ratio of the Higgs to two axions versus the Araxion mass. <coughs> and for f equal 3 TV, so the same benchmark of before, you see that this branching ratio is extremely small. They have a big time beta dependence. You have delta square that contains beta here. And this is, uh, you know, optimistically, and for some values of time beta, within the reach of clique or FCCE. However, you know, this depends as delta square, so the branching ratio of the X scales with F to the fourth. So as soon as you go to lower values of F, this branching ratio can be very big. So for example, here is 0.7 TV, and you can reach values that are already excluded from the LHC, for example, are within the reach of uh, machines like uh, ILC, for example. You don't need to go to FCC. So this is for Higgs decays, then decays of lighter particles. And here is just to give you two kind of benchmark values for this branching ratio. So this is the upsilon decay to gamma scalars, which is one of the first ways that we looked for the Higgs boson and for the Haxion. And here the prediction is that you know, for FA of a TV, you have values of the branching ratio of order 10 to the minus 5. And you produce way more of these particles at, I mean at uh, flavor factories like Babar and Bell. Uh, same for the branching ratio of the B meson to K or K star and, uh, and their action, you have values that are at the level of 10 to the minus 4. Again, within the reach of these machines and also of the LHCB. Then, so, we've, I've discussed about how to produce this particle, then where is the case to? Like, how, we, how can we see it? So here, just to fix a benchmark, tan beta 10, right hand side large anomalies, left hand side sm uh, small anomalies. So this is, if you want the prediction, this gray line that came just from our description of the hidden sector. So nothing about the visible sector and is an invisible decay from the decay into gravitinos that can be also the dominant decay, as you see, in these regions, or almost the dominant one. And this uh, light blue line is the instead the most model-dependent prediction because this depends on the mass of the binos, but I mean we showed it just to say that if some of the gigenos is lighter than their axon, you can have spectacular signals like Diphoton plasmet that are very severely bounded from the LHC. Then, I mean, you can have decays into standard model fermions, into glue glue, so the IJ that can be very large, and diphoton that can be, you know, at the level larger than the Higgs branching ratio into diphotons. Especially for large anomalies, this will be important. Then, if you go to low time beta, I mean, the message is more or less the same. What changes is just that you have a larger branching ratio into TT bar. So you can look for this particle also, also as a TT bar resonance. Well, these plots have this distinctive feature, and if you look at very at the lower end of the EMA branch, Here. somehow the die jet and the, the dielectric branch is suddenly change. Uh, where? Place. The green and the pink line, I mean, at, at on the left on the floor. <laughs> yeah, because this sums. So this is where the tau tau threshold opens. And yeah, here, I mean, uh, there are already many colors, so we plotted all the leptons in the same color, and here you just have, uh, you have mu mu, then I think this is the uh, charm, and then you have tau again, so this goes with the mass square of the, of the particles. And some result of dependence on tambita, but yeah, it's because of the masses, the Yukawas, basically. Yes, so I can show you just to that way. So you see, it's MA to the, fa to the fifth power. Notice that any other action would have another insertion of MA square because it would need more breaking of the, more explicit breaking of the symmetry. So this is why this is large. 
So branching ratios. So last, I mean here, just to tell you that this particle is almost always narrow. This is the width versus the mass. And that if you go below the 2 GV range that we consider, you can have, you know, displaced, I mean, in particular below the QCD scale, you can have displaced vertices, long-lived part, and it could can be a long-lived particle, so it motivates another kind of phenomenology. That is also motivated, just we wanted to focus on the region where this uh, more standard particle in this sense. Then, uh, how to look for it at LHC? So, for example, uh, I said this is a generic prediction, so one can reinterpret missing monojet plus missing energy searches for this particle. This is what we did using these two Atlas papers that were nice enough not only to provide limits in some simplified dark matter model, but also to give tables with bounds depending on the cuts that we could implement in a quick, this uh, if you want a quick and dirty mud graph simulation, but still that gives some uh, reach that you see uh, for large values of the mass, this grows as MA to the five, uh, already probes some parameter space and this is the potential for, uh, for the future. This is just to show that depending on where the binos are, you can have a, a, a very important reach of searches like gamma gamma plus met. These signals, I mean, have little dependence on other model dependent assumptions like anomalies, values of tambita, charges of the xeno, etc. And this is just how they look like for a different value of the anomaly. I mean, you see, there is some dependence, but it's not dramatic. Then, uh, you know, you might have noticed that I didn't talk about Z decays into the axiom, but also the Z in principle can decay into the axiom via this term in the Lagrangian. However, the reach, for example, of machines like LAP is not relevant. Like, notice that here, for little f versus ma, I change scale, so that lab doesn't even reach 100 GV, so little f smaller than v doesn't make much sense. However, for the future, I mean thinking about future colliders, uh, if you think the reach of SCE to be uh, at the level, I mean, this is a line that corresponds to branching ratio 10 to the minus 7 of z to comma a, and uh, if, uh, if one, uh, I mean, if one does a naive luminosity rescaling of lap one searches of this one, this is could be the reach of uh, FCC. Instead, a totally different reach, which goes up to values of more than 100 TV, is the one from the case of B mesons and to some extent Upsilon. And here, you see the same plot, but with a totally different scale, little FMA. Uh, orange is B to K star. I mean LHCB a couple of years ago, looked for resonances in B2K star mu mu, resonance in the mu mu invariant mass, and if you use that search, you, you see it can reach values of F that are, uh, you know, in the regime of a split SUSI more than a natural SUSI. The same, so this is for some values of the parameters. This has some uh, dependence. No, no, here everything is flavor preserving. So the decouplings, two fermions are inherited from the MSSM pseudoscalar big A that has flavor preserving couplings. Here it's just that, I mean, if you, uh, if you draw the standard model loop, you can attach the Araxion to the top, for example, and then it can decay to mu mu, and you search for these bumps, they did it, and they produce uh, you know, a plethora of B mesons, so they are able to put extremely strong bounds here. So this for some values of the parameter, just to show that this, the size of this bound can change, uh, you know, if you are unlucky, for example, with Tambita, uh, depending also on the value of RH, can be reduced, but still you see, uh, you are at the level of uh, 10 TV. For LAP, we are talking about 100 GV. So this is still uh, one of the best performing searches for, for this kind of model. 